I'm so thankful uh, for what he's done in me that I want to live in a way that expresses that gratitude back toward him. Not just in living a life that hopefully pleases him and who I am and what I do, but living with the heart that Jesus came into the world with. Jesus came into the world to do what? To seek and save the who? He came into the world to seek and save the lost. So I want to give some attention to that today, and we're going to be giving attention to that in the next week. Um, as a staff, we're going to be getting together 12 to 1 every day, just praying, God, we need your grace like never before. We want to see God use all this effort that we're investing into uh, the weekend of Easter, where we're going to have the meetings on Friday night, and we're going to have a, the, the meetings on, on Sunday, where people come out of the woodwork. You know, sometimes people... You grow up in traditions like the one I grew up in. People would come to church twice a year. Easter and Christmas. But more Easter than Christmas. And, uh, and I, I think that's just kind of a common thing. And so we're going to have all kinds of people that are, are going to come into the doors of the church. But we need God's grace to even pray that God would stir hearts that they might come here, right? So as a staff, we're going to be doing that this next week. And then uh, the following week leading into Easter, we're going to be inviting everybody to come in every day, 12 to 1, take time to pray. Uh, if you want to fast, intercede, whatever. But we, we, we've, we need to see Jesus show up. It's more than just a play. It's more than just us putting on some drama with some good music. We, we actually need his presence to come. His presence is what changes things. Sometimes people come in here and they'll say, what's that feeling? There's a feeling that's in this place. It's the presence of God. And it's that presence, messages are used, music can be used, but, but it's his presence that begins to do a work in people's lives, and we need his presence like never before. You know, the world's getting darker out there, not lighter. Agree with that? Well, what do you think is going to counter that? Where sin abounds, grace has to abound even more. Grace comes when we call on God. His kingdom is advanced through prayer, and so we're going to take time to pray. Um, but I want to take some time uh, this afternoon or this morning to just remind our hearts of something uh, that I think we try to avoid thinking about. It's something that maybe half the people in America believe about, um, but it's something that most people feel like they, they'll never experience. But Jesus had something, had a different perspective, had something different to say about it. And I, and I want us to be mindful of it. I want us to be living out our faith in the fullness of God's counsel where we're taking into consideration things that meant something to Jesus. You know, if we're going to live like Jesus, we have to be moved by the things that moved him. And what moved Jesus? Well, we're going to give some attention to that right now. So I want to read, uh, it's a passage of scripture. It comes from Luke, the 16th chapter. It starts in verse 19. This is Jesus speaking. He says this. He's telling a story to make a point. He says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen. Today we go, what's that mean? Well, it's like linen and fine purple. Like we, we can go to the store, pick up some linen and paint it purple and it doesn't mean anything. But back in that day, if you wore linen, if you had enough money to buy the rare dye that made clothes purple, it spoke of like extreme wealth and royalty, like you were super wealthy. So Jesus is talking about somebody who didn't just have means, they had a lot of means. And they lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. Lazarus means, the name actually means helped by God. So here's this guy, helped by God, Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. This guy was in such a bad way. He maybe had leprosy. He certainly was poor. He, he would look for crumbs to fall off the table. And this guy, helped by God, doesn't seem like he's got a whole lot of help coming from God. But then there's this really wealthy guy that had everything. That seemed back in that day, if you had a lot of wealth, it meant like God was with you. And if you were kind of cursed and afflicted, it was like God's judgment on your life. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, and he looked up and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus by his side. So imagine, 
Here's a man with no name, defined by his riches, who finds himself in a place of separation, in a place of suffering. And here's a guy that seemed to have nothing, that knew that God was his help, that found himself in a, in a much different position, being in a position of being blessed and having life. One, one has life being taken away from because of the emphasis that they made. The other has life, regardless of what seemed to be a challenge, had, had everything. He knew in, in a life of suffering that God was with him and was helping him, and it paid off into another side of a grave. Goes on to say, so he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you're in agony there. And besides all of this between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot and nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, <clears throat> they will repent. He said to them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone is raised from the dead. Imagine that. It's an allusion to what Jesus would eventually do, obviously. But people would come to see Jesus resurrected from a grave. Jesus, this one who came into the world to fulfill all the prophecies, the one that came into the world to save the world. See, Jesus came into the world to save us from our sins. We all say amen to that. But oftentimes we don't think of where the sins lead to. The sins lead to death. And that death means separation. And that separation means an eternal reality in a different place than God. I know it's going to get really quiet in here. I honestly, I was like, Lord, I don't really want to preach this sermon. People are going to be coming for the first time. That's not like a welcome to the Brooklyn Tabernacle kind of a thing. Um, and it was funny because actually as I was like, I don't know, God, because I felt like I should do this. Uh, around Tuesday I was sitting, I was praying, and then I picked up a book. Um, I was going through a book that Pastor Assembly had written, and it's called Fan the Flame, and I get to like the fourth chapter, and in the fourth chapter, it says, you know what the problem with today's preachers are? They don't preach the full counsel of God. They don't, they don't go in, lean into those subjects that people, that people, you know, will be uncomfortable to hear because they want people to come back, and they're more concerned about the number of people that come to their church than the reality of those people's souls. So I thought, I started laughing. I'm like, he's not even here this week, and yet he still speaks to me. So I'm like, okay, God, I guess I got to lean into this. So I'm leaning into it. And I want to lean into it by asking, answering three questions. Like, what is hell? Why is there hell? And how do we live in light of it? Should hell be a motivating factor in your life? To the Christians, we go, well, why didn't it motivate me? Heaven is my motivation. What I'm going to gain is my motivation. I get that. The, the, I'm not talking about like you're living in fear of some eternal security that God has given you. I'm not, I'm not saying hell becomes some motivation like, oh, my gosh, if I do this wrong, then I'm, I'm going to be punished. No. There should be a bigger picture that motivates us. If these things are real, hell motivated Jesus out of heaven to come into earth. And I'm just asking you believers, this is more of a message today. If you're, if you're somebody that doesn't know Jesus this morning, if you've not been born again, if your heart hasn't been changed, I, I pray that this somehow makes you think because you should think. Life is a vapor, 70 years clips by in a blink. And then eternity begins. This is the staging for what really is. And how you live through this life is gonna determine where you land. So you should think about it. But this really is a message more to believers to stop and say, is hell real? What does the passage teach us? It is real. It's real. 
Jesus is telling a story. And by the way, as we start even to lean into the subject of hell, a lot of people go, oh, Jesus, like he's, he's loving. You know, just, just stick with the love thing. Don't, don't talk about something that could challenge me to sort of have my mind boggled over the fact that maybe Jesus isn't so loving. Well, Jesus is loving, and we're going to see in a second that hell is the expression in a way of love. He goes, that doesn't make any sense. Just hold on. I think it might in a second. But what is hell? Hell is a place that if you read through the scriptures, it's a place of separation. It's a place where because of the separation, there's a torment that ensues. It was a place that was set up not for you and I. It was a place that was set up for Satan and and fallen angels because they rebelled. They were eternal beings that rebelled against God. They said, we know what this is all about. We don't want your way. We want our way. In fact, we want to set up our own little thing here. And he goes, okay, then I'm going to designate a place for you that that can actually happen. But see, everything was made by a God of love for love. And out of that love, we, we exist and we live. But they made a choice to turn from love. And so God said, I'm going to honor it. A special holding place where you'll be able to be separated from what you don't want to live under. Jesus, as he started to talk about this in the New Testament, it was talked about in the Old Testament. David talked about it. Job talked about it. There's other people in the New Testament that talk about it, Peter, John, Paul. But nobody spoke about it collectively more than Jesus. This was something that was on his heart. This was something that was ever before him as he walked down the street and he looked at people, as he, as he lived with family members. What do you think he saw when he looked at them? He saw people, but he saw people that he loved. He saw people that he came into the world to to do something for. And what he came into the world to do was to turn their eternal position around. He was motivated out of love for them because he knew the reality of what would follow. Well, what did Jesus say about hell? He said a lot of things. A lot of things that are gonna be unsettling to even consider. He said, hell is a place of incredible suffering. Place, it's, it's a picture of like eternal fire. And you go, is that real? Like eternal fire? That sounds like hell and brimstone, eternal fire. Those are concepts that actually come from the Bible, come from Jesus. Jesus affirmed it. And yet you go, is it really eternal fire? I would say, I don't know if it really is. Literally, uh, maybe so, but I think the reality of what it is is so much further beyond what the picture represents that we don't find relief. Like, oh, it's just a figure of speech. It's the figure of speech that points to something so much more intense and serious. And along with the idea of this is this eternal lake of fire, it's this idea that in that place, there's, there's weeping. Like not, not the kind of weeping where a tear rolls down the face, but the kind of weeping that happens when tragedy ensues. And there's a sense of something that convulses from the inside of a person where they wail and they lament till they can't do it anymore. Have you ever cried in that kind of a way? I wonder, have you you ever cried in that kind of a way? Have you ever cried at the loss of someone who died? I remember when my mother was given a report that she was supposed to die within a month. That rocked me. I couldn't stop crying. Why? We weren't made to lose people. We weren't made for people to die. We were made to live. And when somebody dies, it's so unnatural. And what comes out of us in this natural way is this emoting of, I don't like the separation. Everything in me is fighting against it. The wailing that comes is something that represents something God never intended. But that little picture, I just give an illustration to say, whatever that is, it's not even a drop in the bucket of what's to come. How about gnashing of teeth? Have you ever gotten hurt, like really hurt, where... I remember one time I was skiing and I ended up, I was doing some stupid things on skis and I I ended up like wrenching my knee and I tore some cartilage in my knee and my knee swelled up like a balloon. I was in so much pain. I couldn't move my leg. I had to go to the hospital. They had to put it in a splint for like a couple of months. I was walking around on crutches. But on the night that I did it, I'm laying in my bed and my mom comes over. I'm I'm laying in bed and I go, Ma, I gotta, actually, I gotta get up. I I have to go to the bathroom. And I said, "Would would you please help me to get would you please help me to get situated here? And she's like, okay. I just spent all day in the hospital. It's like three in the morning. She goes to help me pick my leg off the bed. And when she pulls it off the side, actually, the bed wasn't like this to the ground. The bed was a high bed. It was kind of up like this. And when she pulls my leg off to the side, she just drops it. 
boom. You want to talk about gnashing of teeth? I screw everything in me, the pain of it. I wrenched in a way where I couldn't, I saw stars. <laughs> Have you ever been hurt in that kind of a way? Yeah, well, it's a picture of something that, to come. We weren't made for pain. We weren't made for suffering. It's part of what we end up finding when we choose our way instead of trusting God for his. But it's more than that. There's, there is a, a, a suffering that comes along with it. But one of the pictures that Jesus uses to me that is more challenging than the rest is the idea that we get cast into outer darkness. His words. Cast them into outer darkness. This loving God says, cast them to this place that was set apart for demonic entities that are rebelling and don't want any, they don't want to submit to God in any kind of a way. Put them in that place. Well, what's in that place? You know, the Bible, light is kind of a metaphor for God and it's it's often expressed through the the light of his love. Like love is what we all have. We all live in a fallen world, right? And as messed up as it can be, we still have glimpses of God's kindness and love. You can say, I got a roof over my head. Listen, whether you like it or not, God gave the ability to provide for yourself to have a roof over your head. That that comes from him. Food on the table, those are things we can say in like a trite way, but these are realities. God is showing kindness to a bunch of people that are living, not always submitting themselves to him, but he's, he's still, the light of his love is still shining into the world. Have you ever sensed darkness? I remember growing up, I had a brother, and my older brother, he always liked heavy metal. I mean, he liked a lot of different music, but sometimes as a kid, I would listen to this stuff that would pump out of his stereo. And anybody ever know ACDC? I was like, what is ACDC? What does that mean? Antichrist, devil's children. I was like, what? what? I'm a little kid. I'm like, what does that even mean? Antichrist, devil's children. It didn't mean anything to me. But then... He cranked that thing on and Highway to Hell would come out. I'm on the highway to hell. And this song would be singing. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what that is. I don't know what hell is. I don't know what a highway to hell means. But I'm telling you right now, there's a dark sense that I feel that makes me so uneasy from this music. There was darkness that was like wrapped into the words and the lyrics. And these people are celebrating it like it's a place that you want to go to. Listen, if I, if I can't be in heaven, then I'll be in hell with all of my boys. It's not going to be a party. It's going to be anything but. And in that place of separation, there will be no sense of God's light. On, anybody been depressed? Anybody ever been overwhelmed by the condition of your life to the place where you go, I, I don't know. Like this just, I don't want to go on. I was talking to somebody this, this past week. I, I just want to possibly kill myself. Like you get so clouded by the darkness of this life and the realities that go on inside. You don't even want to carry on. Not to sh- ask for a show of hands, but I mean, I, I'll put mine up. I've been there once or twice in my life, going through some dark things myself. On the darkest day that you've known in this life, it's not a shadow of the darkness that'll come because the absence of God and all of his love in in you being in that place will be something so unbearable. Whatever the gnashing of teeth is, whatever the sense of mourning will be, it'll be because we're so far removed from a God of love that everything that we were made for, we were made for that love, is so far removed from it that we ache, we're in pain, we're suffering as a result. I'm just saying it's not a place, as you consider, that you're like, this is a party. No, it's far from it. It's real, and Jesus spoke about it in real terms. You know, whenever I think about hell and it becomes something that becomes real to me, I, I, I don't think of it because I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to hell. I, I, know where my, I know where my security is. I know I'm going to one day see Jesus face to face. I just know I know I will because of the light of his love that he's made so real and through the faith and trusting in him for it. He, he's, he's given me peace. I, I know where I land. But when I sit on a train, this past week as I've been thinking about this, I get on the train and I, and I look at faces and I look in, into eyes and I think there's a story behind every face. There is a God who loves every, every 
expression of agony that that person has gone through in this life. There's, an, there's a sense of God, we, Jesus weeping. We, Jesus wept over the place in Jerusalem where they rejected him. Like when I look into people's eyes, I look and I think, what, where are they? What, what does that mean? And I'm not gonna, I can't, I can't stop every person. Like I can't sit with every person in this room, but I, I can pray for people. And I'm, God, I'm starting to say, God, give me your heartbeat. Help me to view people the way that you see them. Like as Christians, we can like circle the wagon, shut the craziness that goes off in here, have Taranda lead us in worship and just be like, oh, this is amazing. Praise God. The darkness is being pushed back. The sense of weeping, I find joy. Whatever the pain is, there's healing for it. That's great. Awesome. But that's so that we can walk out those doors and engage the world with the hope and the love of a savior. Because broad is the road. Jesus said this, broad is the road that leads to destruction. What does that mean? That the world is on a path, whether they're singing the song or not, I'm on the highway to hell. You know what's interesting about that thought? Statistically, over half the people in America, uh, they believe in hell. Like 60% of Americans believe in hell. 75% of Americans believe in heaven. 73% of that 75, they believe all you got to do is work really good to get there. Just just be a good person. Which, that's scary as a pastor because if you take 75%, just let's do a cross section here. 75% of the people in here, 73% are like, yeah, we're kind of confused because we think that by hard work and being moral, we can find in eternity a reception by God. It's not true. But do you know what the most interesting part of these statistics are? Do you actually understand it? Two, by, this is true. 2% of Americans believe that they'll ever see hell. 2%. Isn't that, that's alarming. Like half maybe kind of don't believe. In a cross section of America, if there's 300 million people, there's more, but say 300 million. 150 million people are living in absolute darkness. Like, whatever, there's no heaven, hell, whatever, doesn't mean anything. But most are living in a position, like if you're 300 million, you're you're talking about just a a short few that even are living with regard and a concern that that's, that's an eternal reality. And Jesus is going, it's one way or the other. You have Lazarus, you have a rich man, you have people that understand this like Lazarus did and said, God, no matter what my suffering is gonna be, no matter how hard this world is, you're gonna be my help. I'm gonna trust in you. And then there's, there's only two kinds of people in the world, people that understand that God is their help, people that live like Lazarus or people that live to be defined by something in their life, in their heart, in their world. You were made to worship. You're gonna worship something. We were made to have our hearts settled by God. And when we do, we find what we were made for and we know what life is about. And when we don't, we start to look to anything in this world to try to fill in what that is so that as we give ourselves to it, it'll begin to settle us. And and this rich man was driven and he he was worshiping the material security that he had for himself. So there's two people in this room, people like Lazarus and people who are gonna allow their lives to be defined by something else. And you could sit here and say, I'm an atheist. I don't don't wanna worship anything. Just show me what you spend your time on. That's what you worship. What you invest yourself to, what you give yourself to is your God. It defines you, it motivates you, it controls you. So please don't take a position like where you think you have the upper hand on people of faith. You're living yours out just the same, except yours is never gonna produce life, but Jesus will. Now, you could say, we just established hell. So what is hell? We just talked about it. Now, why is there a hell? Maybe just by way of kind of an analogy, this will help us to get why God, why Jesus, if he's loving, has to put in place hell. Why would a loving God, if he's so loving, how could he allow people to be eternally separated from him? That's, that's a crazy kind of contradiction, or so it seems. But you know what's interesting about a question that's posed like that? Maybe you've posed the question yourself. The question actually comes from a place of what this is all about. It's, it comes from a, a motivation in you of, you think you can judge God? 
You think that in your questioning the character and the nature of God, you've got enough perspective, enough depth that you can actually, through your question, be like, well, who does God think he is to send somebody to hell? The actual question should be, how can people with such a loving God make a choice to want to choose their own way instead of trusting him? Just let that sit in for a second because who is God that he would judge people? You better, be, you better hope with every fiber of your being that he judges people. Look in your family. Look at the world around us. I was, uh, I was reading this past week on the subway. There's craziness that goes on on the subway, right? There's craziness that goes on in the city. People getting stabbed, people getting shot. Those are pictures of what happened when people live for themselves. God doesn't produce that. That's what we produce. And so somebody gets on a train. They, uh, not too long ago, I read a, a story of where a person got on a commuter train in Philadelphia and raped a woman on the train. Who would say if that was your sister or your mother or your daughter that got raped? Like, yeah, just let the person go. They're good. I, let's believe the best here. They're going to turn around and then they go do it again. At what point do you stop and say, let's put a box around this? Because to let that person continue to live in society and to continue to inflict because of their selfishness and the wickedness that's in them, to continue to inflict that kind of damage on the greater body of society? Like, we believe in prisons. To some extent, you do. I don't care if we talk about defunding the police. You start defunding the police too much and you start to go, wait, was that a good idea? I mean, let, let's do reform in whatever way we need to, but we need somebody policing the realities of what goes on inside all of us because it's craziness that's in here. If somebody hurt one of my kids, oh my goodness, I would be like, listen, I'll turn the other cheek all day long, but you're gonna touch one of my kids, I'm gonna do something about that. And I think you would too. I don't care if you're a father or mother. Mama Bear would come out of most of the women sitting in here if somebody tried to come and hurt one of your little ones. My daughter-in-law is about this big. She's tiny. And she, I was, had my grandson over at the house yesterday, and this is the most time I've spent with him since he's been born. And I uh, yeah, love him, right? Love him. As small as my little daughter-in-law is, she was watching the way I was holding him. Emily, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I was, I was paying attention yesterday. Like, l l let me help you with that. Like, I, l I've had four kids. I've held four kids. I kind of know what I'm doing. But I felt nervous. I'm like, I, I'm going to mess the kid up. Like, I don't know. <laughs> she's like, no, you go like this and you do that. I'm like, I, okay. Um, why would she do that? Because she's a mama bear. Now, imagine if somebody tried to come against her. I don't care if she's five foot nothing and nothing. She doesn't weigh much there would be something that would come out of her in a protective way to say, in love, I am not gonna allow anything to come against. It's instinctive. And yet when, when we take whatever that instinctive reality is, whether people are getting incarcerated, whether there's nation fighting against nation, you know, we, we all should be happy that uh, America and their allies during World War II did what they did against the Nazis or we'd all be speaking German today. Right? We understand that there is in some way a, a good way of responding to try to keep the evil that's in people in check. God is no different. When God made us and we were made to be kind of these eternal beings and then we turned our own way and said, God, even though you love us, we want to do what we want to do. We want to define what we think is best. We turned from him and then we started to go into the dark and we started to make a mess of things in that progression of life, God had to get to a point in the sixth chapter of Genesis where he said, I got to actually mark their days because their wickedness grows with such intensity that he got to a point with the flood that he had to say, I'm sorry that I ever made them. And that wasn't in an eternal way. That was in a very temporal way. Imagine what unchecked sin does into eternity. Do you think of a loving father is going to allow unchecked sin to go on forever? Aren't you tired of the hell that you live with? Think of the, your family. Think of the things that were done by people that lived just the way that they wanted to live at your expense and the pain that it caused for you, right? 
think of the society and the things that you've experienced. You, you look at it and you say, if this went on forever, how loving could God be? We would get to a place and say, how long, God, could you allow this? Let's put an end to it. And he says, oh, I am. I am, and it's going to be an eternal end. And I'm going to separate everything that's wrong from what's right, from, from those that don't want to trust me and live for me, from those that want to be like Lazarus and know that their help comes from me. So God sets it up, and God honors what people want to do. You don't want me? I'll respect it for eternity. But I'm not going to tolerate your only help to even live this thing right is if you depend on me. But if you don't want to depend on me, then okay, have at it. But this is where it's going to lead. So fair warning to all of us. You will breathe your last breath. I don't care if you don't believe in hell. Jesus is not a man that he should lie. What he says is true. I don't want to preach fire and brimstone. It's just the reality of where this all is leading. In your 10 years, your 15 years, your 50 years, your 75 years, however long you have, you got to stop and say, am I living in light of eternity? You should consider it. But a loving God is going to put an end to it. And it is loving that he does. Now, these things being true, I just want to ask the question, so then how do we live? You're a believer here. How then do you live in light of these truths? I want to put up a scripture and I'm going to have you read it. I just want to draw from the text what uh, some of the responses to this that I think we should give. No, uh, go back before that. I jumped into the message. I, I got ahead of them. They don't know where we are. Uh, I'm going to actually, I'll just read it from here if you want to put it up. Uh, so in the 24th verse, it says this. So he called to him. This is Lazar, This is the, the rich man crying out from, from the, uh, hell. Father, Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this place. How do we live? As I said before, I don't think we should, as Christians, be living in some sort of fear that if we make a mistake, we're going to see this in a second, that somehow we could lose salvation. That's covered. Jesus dying on a cross covered that. But as we look at Lazarus, Jesus is making a point here. There is going to be a pain and a suffering that come on the other side of a grave. This is going to be real. And you can say, well, that's 50 years down the road. That's far removed. I'm only 20. I don't want to have to think about that right now. I would recall just some of the comments I just made to your mind. Hell isn't some far off distant place. Seeds of it are within. What, what makes hell hell is this thing in me that says, I don't want you, I don't need you, I got this. And all the things that we just talked about from pain, from suffering, whatever you're gonna find in hell, we've already experienced in this life. And I'm just saying, how do we live? We should be motivated in those moments when we look at ourselves and we see what sin produces, the pain, the suffering, the darkness, and say, wow, the reality of it should motivate me to stay close and dependent on a savior. Like this guy's eternally tormented because he didn't want a savior. And what's interesting about Jesus and what he says in this passage about this guy in his position of suffering, notice that he doesn't say, come get me out. He knows he deserves it. There will never be a person that finds himself in a place of separation from God and feel in some way that they have been unjustly treated. All he was asking for is relief in that place. And I would just say, forget about the relief that we aren't going to have to worry about longing for in the future. We can have a relief today in the position that we're in with those seeds of what's to come that we're fighting through. Those things should be reminders to you as you look in your life, as you look in the lives of other people, as you see pain and you see suffering. They should be things that draw us closer to Jesus, not further away from him. 
There should be motivation to say, you know what? How do I live in light of hell? Whatever it is to come, I know that there's realities of it within, and because of it, I need Jesus this morning. I've woken up enough times in my life where I've regretted where I've gone with my life, and waking up saying, you know what, God? I've, I've, I've tasted enough hell in this life. I need you this morning. I don't even want to look to anything else. I don't want to be presumptuous and think that I got this through the day. I'm going to live in a position of humility and dependency because I can't do one thing apart from you. And in fact, isn't that what Jesus said? You can't do anything without me. But what begins to help us to be motivated to wake up in the morning and say, let's go, Jesus. Reminders of the hell that we've created in our own life and the suffering that it's produced for other people. Don't try to live out this life independent of God. That creates more hell. Live in dependency. We have to be motivated with humility and dependence. They say, Jesus, help me. Amen? Amen. How, how do we live? Second response to how do we live, I would say this. When you consider, when you consider his comments, him being Lazarus, he's petitioning Jesus, or he's petitioning Abraham, saying, Abraham, please go tell my family, go tell my brothers. They're, they're on their way. I know they are because they were just like me. Would you please go warn them? Imagine in hell, it's so ho horrible, so awful. There, there's no party going on there. He's saying, get, get my family, get them turned around, go, go visit them, give them an apparition, give them something that'll stop them in their tracks. Wake them up, get them to a place of fear where they'll say, no, okay, I'm gonna turn. If that's true for a rich man in heaven, or a rich man in a place of separation from God, where he has that kind of concern over those that don't know, how much more true should it be for you and I? And do you realize that you have a responsibility along with me Jesus came into the world to seek and save the lost. It was his mission. It wasn't to make a lot of money. It wasn't to have a nice, perfect family. It was, it was to fulfill the mission that he was called to do. What was his calling? To seek and save the lost. Lost what? Lost in their sin, yes. But lost in a position in eternity, they'll be completely separated from God. Jesus was motivated. Jesus came into the world because of the love of the Father. It so consumed him. It was so united with it that he was compelled to do everything that he could to try to turn the condition of those that he came into contact with around. There's, there's to whom much has been given, there's a sense of obligation that comes along with it. True? How many of you think that's true? If you're, if you're holding up your hand and you say that's true, you're a Christian, I just want you to read this passage of scripture with me. It's out of Ezekiel and it says this. This is, this is God speaking to Ezekiel and he's saying to Ezekiel, he says, when I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. What am I saying today? That a world apart from Jesus, Jesus is saying to that world, you're gonna die. It's appointed man wants to die and then there's judgment. You're gonna be judged. There is a judge who's loving that wants to cover over the judgment. But if you refuse it, we gotta warn people because the outcome of their rejection is serious. So he's saying, you wicked person, you will surely die. And he goes on to say, and you don't speak out to dissuade them from their ways? That wicked person will die for their sin and I will hold you accountable for their blood. That's kind of intense. This is an intense sermon, I know, I'm sorry, but I gotta preach the full counsel of God's word. So this was to a prophet that was called by God, set apart to go to his people and say, you're living crazy. There's a God that you say you're honoring and with your mouth you're honoring, but the reality is your heart is far from him. So repent, get back into a position. You're being warned, judgment is coming. He's saying to Ezekiel, I'm calling you to do this. And he likened it before this, this verse, he likens it into a picture. Back in the day, if there was a, a fortified city that was living under the threat of uh, attack and destruction, they would appoint people as watchmen that would stand on the walls. And if you saw dust coming over the horizon in a desert place, you could see if people were coming in mass, there would be dust that would come. Oh my goodness, wait, blow the trumpet. And then blowing the trumpet, that would signal everybody to be alert because an enemy is about to attack. 
He's saying, this is what I'm calling you to do, Ezekiel. You better tell them what I'm saying to you. And if you don't, their blood is on your hands. Now we're going to get really silent. Because on the train, in your family, on your job, there are objects of God's love that he, in a sovereign, strategic way, has put you in their path because he wants you to sound the alarm. And we, have to, we need wisdom in how we do that. I'm not trying to club us over the head like fire, hell, and judgment, and brimstone, and like scare somebody into the kingdom of God, but in a loving way, addressing people and telling them there's a savior for their sin. There's a savior who can help them, not just be saved from eternal lakes of fire, but a savior who can help them to live now, to get beyond the hell that's within them that they would begin to know life and receive deposits of heaven that'll give them hope to live. But you and I have a responsibility. It's serious. As we're trying to prepare our hearts to go into this Easter season, this is not about Pastor Simbola, Pastor Burgos, Pastor Hammond, Pastor Fritz, and me like doing our job and, and like we're here to do everything that we can to strengthen you, to build you up so that you can go sound the alarm. That's your job. Go into all the world, make disciples. Jesus has commanded it. It's not an option. As he said to Ezekiel, I'm calling you to do this now, go. And if you don't, their blood is on your hands. That's really too intense. It's the word of God. Take it up with him, not me. So this has been very heavy, I know, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this to a place where when we go, it's not that we just go. We have to go in the same spirit that Jesus came into the world. What's the spirit that he came into the world? He came into the, the world with a spirit of mercy. And mercy is this quality of God that it always blows me away when I consider it. Like I, I can't even talk about the mercy of God with it not affecting the deepest part of who I am. Mercy is this, it's this, it's this idea, it's a picture, even when we were saying before, the, when there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, like this convulsive thing that comes out of people when they're going through incredible like separation and suffering. Have you ever seen somebody really like wail over the loss of a, of a person or over something that's happened to them? It comes from the deepest part of their gut. And the Bible describes God with bowels of mercy which means when he looks at the condition that man has created for himself by rejecting his love and destroying his life and destroying this creation, that is, if we do it right, if we trust in him for what it is, there's blessing that follows, there's joy, there's peace, there's, there's real living that's experienced. We made a choice to say, and by the way, a loving God, if he forced his love on you, would no longer be loving. That'd be authoritarian. That, that, would, be, that would be aggressive. God is, he creates us in love and says, listen, I... I don't want to force my love on you. I'll tell you who I am. I'll show you who I am and I'll invite you in to reciprocate. Will you reciprocate? And the picture of his mercy that he's hoping we would reciprocate to is Jesus coming into the world because God looked at your life and he looked at mine and he said, I can't handle Suffering, it creates suffering in the heart of God to watch what you and I do to destroy our lives and destroy our world. It breaks him. It breaks him. He weeps over our sin. If he wept over Jerusalem, do you not think he weeps over you? Do you not think he weeps over the world that we're in? He does. But it's not just, mercy isn't just a feeling. It's a feeling that compels somebody to act. And so Jesus came into the world because he had to do everything that he could to sound the alarm. But his life became the alarm. His life became the picture on a cross, we're going to, I didn't bring it up. On a cross, Jesus had his body broken. He had his body broken and he had his blood poured out. I, I thought this might be an appropriate way to end the message because hell is such an overwhelming thought and it, it's such a, you start to think about it and just your, your mind can start to reel. But whatever the thought is, I want to ground it in the mercy of God and the love of God. Jesus came because he knew you and I could never clean ourselves up. There's no choice. There's no chance. We, it's not like good, 
on the scales of justice, if you do enough, it balances it out. No, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do to clean yourself up. Jesus came into the world to save you from you, to save you from what you produce, to save you from how in your own way of living, you'll be separated from God into eternity. But for here and now, he came to save you and to give you life in an abundant way here and now, but it came on a cross. There is punishment. This, this is the most mind-blowing part of the message. If you, have, if you fall asleep, please wake up. If you've tuned out because you think that the, the message is too intense, just please listen, because this is the best part of the message. Those things are true. How then should I live in light of a Savior that's come into the world and done for me what he has done? How should I live? I should live in awe, in wonder. I should be so thankful that this Savior came into the world to allow himself the most brutal part. We're gonna see this acted out on the platform. The stage behind me is gonna be the thing that we use to give a visual picture to people of what Jesus came into the world to do. But 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary, Jesus allowed himself the punishment, the bloodshed, the brokenness, all that's horrible. But the worst part of it was he came to allow himself to be separated from his father so that you and I could be united in an eternal way with that love. Knowing that we were separated, he took on our life, he took on our sin, he took on the judgment that we deserve. Whatever hell was, this, the, think about what Jesus suffered on the cross. Whatever hell was, there is. Jesus took it upon himself. The full wrath of God was put on Jesus on a cross. Why? So that you and I would never have to experience what the eternal outplay of hell would actually be. And you can say, God is so unjust for hell. I would say, is he? Because he actually, in a way, took it upon himself so that we would be spared from it. He's holding us to a standard that he came and lived out. He's not saying, here's the standard, try to do it. He said, I'll come and do for you what you can't do for yourself. I'll be perfect. You want to know the, the love of a perfect God? You'll never be able to get the account for yourself. So I'll live it out and I'll come and I'll give it to you. And I'll take from you everything that would stand in the way of that relationship. And I'll allow myself to become your sin. And I'll allow myself to experience the full weight of the judgment that your sin deserves so that what? so that we would know peace with God. We would know eradication of sin in our life and that one day we would be able to live without any encumbrance of sin forever. That's amazing. How many of you say amen to that? Because that is incredible. Jesus, how should I live? I should live with that kind of an appreciation, grounding all that I am and all that I do into the reality that if he loves me like this, no matter what I face, it's gonna work out good because he invested all that he had into my life. Well, you have, you have these little elements in front of you. I'm gonna ask you if you would. Take the bread. Bread represents the judgment of God. Jesus broke the bread and he said, he gave it to the disciples. Do this in remembrance of me. Do what? Break the bed. May it be a reminder to you that I was broken for you, that I was broken instead of you, that I was broken so that you wouldn't have to be. I took your judgment. We're here today to celebrate the taking of that judgment. Amen? If you have it, it's not, as Pastor Burgo said, it's not something you do lightly. It's something that you gotta take an account of and go, God, is there any, is there anything that I continue to do that fights against your loving rule in my life? If so, don't make him any promises. Don't, don't act like you're gonna turn a corner. Just acknowledge that he came to do for you what you couldn't do for yourself. And that by taking the bread, you're saying, God, I, I don't wanna go in that direction anymore. What brought you judgment, I wanna respect, so help me, help me now. Confess it to him before we even take this together. Just in your heart, Lord, you know what it is. Here it is. Forgive me. Thank you for taking the judgment that would separate me from you. Well, let's take it together.
as you take that, I'm going to now ask you to flip the cup over. The juice that's in here represents the blood of Christ. That's kind of gross. No, it's not. It's, it's a symbol. Life blood is represented in what Jesus shed. Blood is a representation of life. And his perfect life was poured out to cover over your imperfections. And this is an amazing reality. Because what we're celebrating is Jesus on a cross washed your life with his. And when that washed over life means that now you've been perfected, as it says in Hebrews, forever. You've been perfected forever. You're, you're still struggling to let your account here catch up with your account there. But even if you just confess sin, that sin is something Jesus has covered over. We're celebrating forgiveness of sin. We're, we're celebrating the holiness that we've received. Can we take this together? Let's just do this. Let's take a second and pray. Father, how then should we live? Oh God, we should be a people. Even as we celebrated this incredible symbol of all that you've done, God, we ask you today that it would grip our hearts. We ask you today, God, that it would motivate us to not just live right before you, but it would motivate us to go into the world on your behalf and proclaim the hope of a savior, to herald that trumpet in the families that we're a part of, in the neighborhoods that we're in. Oh God, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus, but let it be something that goes beyond this moment and forgotten. Let it be something that indelibly gets emblazoned on our heart that we would live, God, live to give our lives away to the cause of Christ, live to see others come to know the hope that there is in Jesus. God, whether it's people sitting here in this room, whether it's people watching online, God, we're asking by your spirit to move in our lives, to move in our our hearts to make us a people who live in light of these eternal realities we can't conjure it up but God we can open our hearts up and say come help us we need you we need you Jesus can you tell him how much you need him now can you say it now we need you Jesus Taranda is going to lead us in a song please don't leave yet She's going to lead us in a song, and then we're going to close in a word of prayer. The blood that Jesus shed for me
praise God for the blood of Christ Jesus. Now, can we do this before we leave? Um, if, if you're a Christian, I'm going to ask you, just find another Christian right now and pray, not just in this season, but in the life that's before the other that you're praying for, that God would help them to be motivated to live in light of what Jesus has done and in light of what it means for others. Can we pray that God would stir our hearts, that we would see people for what it is. If they're not in him, we understand what that now means. Pray that God would give us his heart like Jesus to go and to seek and to save the lost. Can we do that? Can you take a second, men with men, women with women, if you're with your husband, and pray for them, wives the same, but can, can we just take a second? Let's, let's pray this truth into our hearts right now. Find somebody to pray with. ask you, be a people, make us a people, God. This is something that has to come through revelation. I've tried the best way that I know to communicate something that concerns your heart, God. Hell is real, and you don't want anybody to go there, and you've appointed us to go into this world to herald the hope of Jesus. Help us, God, to trumpet his life, to trumpet his message everywhere that we go. God, give us divine appointments even this week that'll help us to encourage others with the hope of a Savior. But God, this isn't something we just intellectualize. You give us, even as we're praying, we're praying because we know we need your help to even have our hearts stirred in the right kind of a way to apply it to our lives. So do it, Jesus. Help us. By your Spirit, help us. We're so thankful, God, for what you've done. We're so grateful today that we can celebrate the wonder of what you've done, the wonder of your mercy. Help us to leave here full of joy, not depressed by a message that we heard, but full of hope for what lies before us. We have the hope of heaven. Help us to declare that. Help us to live it out, that it might honor Jesus in everything that we do all of our days. It's in his precious name we said amen. Listen, before you go out, just be mindful. We were talking today about an idea called justification. It's how God justifies a sinful person. 
We're gonna learn more about it after this, right now, after the class, out the door to the left, to the end of the street left, up on the fifth floor of the building that's behind. You're gonna have my son, Luke Petri, who's gonna be up there teaching the class. It's a foundation of faith point that you're not gonna to wanna to miss. So if you can, go join him. Otherwise, have a great week. Listen, oh, one last thing. Sorry, 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 one last thing. Tuesday night, we're gonna pray. I'm gonna lead in a, in a, in a message on, on Tuesday night. Praying for people that are enslaved. Praying for people that are imprisoned by the sin that they might face. Bring a picture out. We can leave it here on the steps. We'll give it to the prayer band. They'll put the name of the person on there. Give us whatever the issue might be. We'll pray for it, but we're gonna pray for people on Tuesday night. Come out, loved ones that need Jesus. Bring, bring the card with you. We're gonna pray over them. God bless you, have a great week.